In the uh, 60s and 70s was, uh, was very rough and, uh, and, uh, and an exciting place. Everyone knew everyone. It was a very uh, small community and, and lots of camaraderie. And, and I think that's what made me stay is I, I, I made lots of great friends and I still have them. And, and uh, I enjoy the, the small town community. So when I first started skiing here, which was prior to 77 when I finally bought property, I had a camper and we used to park in what is now the village, which was the garbage dump which was the area that you could ski out on the Olympic run at the end of the day and be in your vehicle and have your sandwiches and or spend the night there. We used to spend the night in that dump. What you did was uh, get the bus and ride the bus down to Whistler, which of course there was nothing in this end of the town at that time. So we would take the bus and go up the, the old gondola at Whistler, ski all day and then ski out uh, on the Olympic run at the end of the day. And thinking about what's there now and having seen the medical facility and a little trailer sit over there and and all the things including the difficulties that went on during the early 80s when things kind of came to a standstill it's pretty unique to walk in there i go to the physiotherapist fairly regularly they're sitting right smack in the middle of what used to be the dump when i moved here i was going into grade nine and uh, we went to squamish to high school actually everybody went to squamish to school because there was no school here then and so we'd get up very early in the morning and i'd have to walk from the um where the youth center is, or youth hostel is now, over to the Husky gas station, or the Petrocan now, I guess. And that's where we would catch our bus. Then it would take us a ha an hour and a half to get to Squamish. And um, there were maybe 10 or 12 people on the bus at that time, and only about four or five teenagers living here at the time. So my, most of my social life would have been on the weekend skiing. Um, and I, I really liked living here when I was a teenager. There weren't very many people living here then. There was only three or four lifts, the gondola, the red chair, and the upper tea bar. And um, I had a lot of fun, and I loved living here. In the early days, it was impossible to buy um, anything in the community. If you wanted to do a laundry, a grocery shop, or buy a, a half sack of beer, you had to go to Squamish. Now, it's, um, it's, it's right here. And, um, and to see the, how the, the, the community has developed is, is, is wonderful. Uh, when we just moved into Whistler in the, in the 70s, you know, I always remember the silence of this valley. You know, like you could hear your heartbeat, boom, 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 nothing. Dirt road, and it was so quiet. There was no paving at all. When I first came, everything was gravel. Well, there were no street lights or anything like that. It was all gravel roads. But um, I do remember a few times when we'd have a good snowstorm, and it would take a long time for them to clear. And often I could cross-country ski home down the highway. I remember a friend of mine, Alex Bunbury, who was on the ski patrol, had a place up on the hill. And it was an old deserted cabin. And he says, well, if you want to live there, you can. Uh, I'll be 50 bucks a person per month, but go ahead. And uh, so I did uh, jump at it because I thought it was a romantic place to live. And we didn't have any firewood. It had snowed like three feet. We didn't have any propane for the, for the gas uh, stove or, or fridge. But uh, we got in there and uh, p we pounded a path up there every, every day for home from work. It was like 500 vertical feet and half a mile home every night. So. Uh, Lived without running water and electricity for four years up there. I loved it so much. To be honest with you, just to have a ski, a ski place up here uh, that had electricity, running water, and um, washing facilities and things was pretty special. And there was a lot of labor needed here. And if you were willing to lend a hand, you could have a job at almost anything. Friday afternoons, every two weeks when you got paid, you finished work at four, the banks closed in Squamish at five, and there was no one here that would cash a check, especially not a Whistler Mountain check, because they <laughs> already had quite a few financial problems. Uh, it wasn't a very uh, uh, solid enterprise at that point in 1972. It was just sort of starting to show some signs of life with busy weekends and nobody here during the week. So the, the exodus, at four o'clock, you stood in line, you got your check, and you drove like a madman down to Squamish. And you had to make it by five in order to get money, 
because the grocery stores had had enough bounced Whistler Mountain checks that no one would uh, honor the check unless it came cash. So you had to get to your bank, you had to get it in there, you had to get the money out and then run to the grocery store. And if you needed a doctor or a dentist appointment, because there was nothing in the community at that time. So all of that was somewhere else and you had to rush to get there. I do don't miss <coughs> that part even in the least. It was tough living and it was a, it was a poor place to bring up kids. And uh, now it's become a mature community. Um, you know, there's lots of facilities here. It's fairly easy living. It's expensive. Um, but it's a good place to raise kids. I have two kids here. Uh, my kids love it here. It's, uh, there's lots going on for them. We've got, you know, schools, high schools, lots of facilities, lots of things happening. So. coming to town is uh, very exciting, especially for the athletes and the mounts who uh, live in Whistler to be able to compete in your own resort town and also the mounts from BC and Canada. And for all of us to show the world hospitality and what a beautiful place Whistler is, that to me is the most important thing. Hosting the Olympic Games in 2010 will let a lot of people from around the world see what I consider to be one of the most beautiful parts in the world to live. There are an awful lot of people I have no idea until they hit that Squamish Highway. The views, the scenery, the country is beautiful and we live from Vancouver to this area is probably the most choice part of the world to live in. My feeling is we will showcase what British Columbia, Canada has to offer. We were involved with the Calgary 88 Olympics as officials and we know from the inside what it's like to live through the Olympic experience. Um, it's wonderful. It's, it boosts community pride. It, it just creates such a marvelous feeling amongst the people in the community that we can, uh, certainly David and I can see it as a, a really good thing to do and to be a part of. I'm feeling that it's going to be a benefit to the community, basically because uh, the industries in, in the Lower Mainland and Squamish have changed from, you know, the, the basic resource industries like logging and mining, and uh, we need to have some other kind of uh, financial um, encouragement to bring people here, and I think this will help. And uh, it'll, it, we hope, and, and there's been lots of studies done, there's volumes of studies on how we're going to best have sustainable uh, community, environment, and, and uh, many other uh, things that are happening. Uh, the legacies, we hope, will benefit the community in the future, you know, well beyond our time here. <clears throat> so that's, that means uh, to me that there's a, a benefit to it, and I think we'll have to continue to support uh, some of the issues, I mean, we all have different ideas uh, on how the best do that, but uh, I think that uh, eventually um, things will resolve and there'll be a, a lot of things that will help with, with the, the sustainability of the community. Uh, facilities and programs for the youngsters, more than anything. Um, I, I think that came out of the, the Olympics in 88 out of Calgary. They, they, rather than just have a, uh, an event for, for um, commercial business and to, to have a, a, a winter games, they decided that they wanted to have something uh, left for the, the youngsters of the community. And if, I, and if we can end up with that, and by legacies I don't mean just facilities, I mean um, uh, ongoing financial programs that are going to fund uh, the, the, the development of, of youngsters within sport. We were definitely not in favour actually of the Olympics in the, in the original because uh, we thought Whistler had expanded to its full and uh, we didn't really want, think we needed anything anymore. But now that uh, we have the Olympics, now we have to uh, um, basically get on the bus and uh, we have no hard feelings about that and we will uh, do our best to uh, join everybody in making sure that it's a great success and I'm sure it will be. 
Whistler has never uh, let us down in the past and why should it let us down in the future? Well, to me, the Olympics are going to bring big changes as it happened when skiing first came in the mid-60s. So we're going to have to adapt our lifestyle and realize that there are changes that we have to face regarding highway development, um, more difficult parking, all that sort of thing. But I think we should adapt to it because it's going to be good in the long run for the economy. And any business area has to keep rolling and bringing in new ideas, new things in order to be successful. And therefore, I think as it is coming, we all have to pitch in and see that it's on the right track. I sort of think of Whistler as being two different places, what it was like in the early days and what it's like now because it's changed so much. A lot of differences. Um, there was no black home in those days. There was no peak chair in those days. Everybody hiked if you wanted to get into the, if you wanted to get into any powder snow, if you wanted to ski the shell slope or if you wanted to get into Whistler Bowl, everybody hiked for powder snow and when the powder snow was skied out then everybody stopped hiking which meant no no moguls ever got built up. And so as soon as you got new snow, you could go back up and do it again. Well, they had the, uh, the initial small gondola at a creek side, and then uh, you went on to a, a double uh, red chair, which moved agonizingly slow up to what was the roundhouse in those days. And uh, you sat there and froze to death for about 25 minutes going from the, <laughs> from the mid-station to the top. Uh, the roundhouse, the only heat they had was a fireplace in the middle, and that was very popular. It was difficult to get near that because everybody had their feet up on the, around the fireplace. Uh, the skiing was, of course, no grooming, so whenever we had a dump, uh, there was just, uh, especially if it was soggy, it was uh, pretty deadly. Lots of people got hurt. Uh, when I first came here, uh, I didn't know anything about skiing powder, but you had no choice. There was nothing but powder because uh, there was no grooming done. So we did a lot of hiking, and uh, the uh, nice thing about it is that uh, with a three-quarter hour to one hour hike from the top of the upper T-bar, we could ski 5,000 vertical down what's now Peak to Creek. And we could do that for two or three or four days after the storm and stitch up our own tracks. Nobody else was going there. The natural surroundings of the place, uh, you just couldn't uh, resist it. It was very, very quiet in those days, obviously. There were probably 100 people living here full-time or less. And uh, living in the city, living in Vancouver, it becomes almost like a drug, it's an, it's an addiction. You come up here every Friday night, you go home every Sunday night, and every Sunday night when you, when you drive home you say, God, I wish I could find a way that I wouldn't have to drive here anymore. And eventually so you just stick your neck out and you make the move and you come and, and you eke out a living whichever way you can. And I was on the first two town councils. I was an alderman on the first two town councils. Uh, along with Pat Carlton and Al Rain and uh, Gary Watson and Bob Bishop. And then I would say that most of the planning that uh, carried Whistler through for the next 25 years was done on those first two councils. Um, we were instrumental, instrumental in organizing uh, the development of the village, the original village, getting Blackcomb ski area developed. Uh, zoning, setting up all the zoning, setting up the community plan, uh, and a whole lot of other things that went, that happened in those first uh, four years. I mean, the trail system is good, the facilities are good, the library is good. Now we're getting some, some culture in the community, or we've, uh, we've had for some years now, and, and, um, and I, 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 th I, I think we're, uh, we're on the right track. I, I can't imagine, I mean, there was no handbook on how to build a Whistler. I mean, it wasn't as though these guys had a, a dictionary and said, let's see, let, how do we build a Whistler? They did it by, well, let's think this thing through. And the way it's evolved, I think, because of their uh, sitting back a little bit and thinking things through, it has been good, or is good, and it's going to get better. To be totally honest, uh, I have mixed feelings on the Olympics. 
for a simple reason that I personally think that the Olympics have somewhat uh, passed their uh, best before date of their shelf life in the sense that they've become a massive marketing campaign over the years rather than a real sporting event for young people. Uh, that's a bit of a thing that, that I have been problems with. Another item that I really find hard to reconcile is the last little while we've been bombarded, uh, if not drowned, by the word sustainability. And of course, I'm quite sure there's lots of people in everywhere that are sort of wondering what is it actually that we're trying to sustain. But if you start looking at the basic spirit of the word, to me, sustainability in the Olympics just happened to wind up at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And I have a bit of a difficulty how this is reconciled so easily. Well, I guess that to me it means that the world's finally recognized Whistler for the great ski area it is. And now it means after the games we'll have a lot more world tourists coming around to ski here and see the great mountain and the vast ski area we have. Whistler hosting the 2010 Winter Games to me means great opportunities for the arts in Whistler. And I'm, I'm hoping that there will be some lasting legacies for the arts. Maybe there'll be a performing arts center, maybe there'll be uh, something that could be an art school. And, and my, my hope is that you know eventually Whistler will be known for the arts as well as, as for recreation. I feel that we may be on the fringes of the community because we'll be that much older again, but it would be nice if the community could make use of, there are a lot of very talented seniors in this area, and um, it would be nice if they could be used uh, to enhance the Olympics and, um, and make it even a, a greater success because there are, as I said, there are a lot of very talented pe senior people here. Uh, the biggest thing for me is that our community has always been uh, community dependent upon development. So we've exchanged development rights in order to get amenities put in place, but we're finished with that phase of our building. And now we are moving over into an event dependent community, which is what we were built for, to host people and events and groups to come here and enjoy the natural environment. So the Olympics is really just, although a very large one, is another event and it's an opportunity for us to get the facilities and elements in place so that we can host people better. And I'm looking forward to uh, the maturity it'll bring to our community and the international uh, vision that it can help us uh, attain. For I think for both of us what it means is an opportunity to uh, meet with a lot of people from other parts of the world and to be able to show off uh, the beauty of Whistler and, uh, and frankly all of British Columbia. Really it's the culmination of what is 50 years of work and effort, planning, uh, lobbying of government, a lot of people working with uh, commitment to bring about the development of the, of the community uh, it's evolved uh, over that 50-year period and uh, that's what got Whistler started was the idea of bringing the Olympics here and uh, we worked very hard on unsuccessfully as it turned out on several bids but those bids lay the foundation for the concept of what Whistler could become and now in 2010 uh, it's really the culmination of so many years uh, of that kind of work. Uh, it's a dream come true for Franz Wilhelmsen, whose vision it was. Uh, he would be very proud to see this happen, and it was his vision. And as a child, I remember growing up having the, the ski heroes at the Olympics and all that kind of stuff, so it means a lot to me. And hopefully I'll be able to contribute with my avalanche dog at that time and be part of the, uh, the safety that goes on in the mountains. I think it's going to be wonderful. And everyone has worked so terribly hard to get the Olympics at Whistler. So I wish them well. You know, I sort of think it's, it shows that Whistler uh, has come to a certain level of maturity. If we had the Olympics in 76 and Whistler, Whistler wasn't going to be ready for it. And the whole place would have developed around the Olympics. I think Whistler developed on its own properly. And now we can host the Olympics 
because we're ready for it. Well, I believe the changes started when the road brought in more people than came by train. Uh, it brought all kinds, as I've mentioned. There were good and bad, as everywhere. I think that they were so focused on skiing that for many, many years, most of those people who were very keen didn't even know that Alta Lake, per se, not just the lake, but the situation here, existed. And they were extremely surprised whenever they spent a bit more time here to find that there was a chain of lakes, that there had been summer activity, that life existed here, and they only came to the east side of the valley, and of course Creekside is where it started, and they were very limited as to what they understood the whole valley was about. A contribution that is probably a lot of times overlooked is the plain fact that many of the old timers have just stuck around. Because if they would have just tossed in the towel and left and said, the hell with this, I mean, I can't earn a living here, I gotta go, this would have never taken off. Uh, the fact that they've actually stuck around and, and, and went through, through down times and so on is, is as well a contribution to this community. I have a very positive memory of the past and also I still really enjoy myself at this time here. I think it's a great place to live. I was municipal clerk for 10 years and we've just lost Pat Carlton, our first mayor. And Pat, I, the memories are, are flooding back when we lost Pat of the times that we had in the beginning of the, the start of the Whistler Village and the start of Whistler as it is today. And the times that we had with those councils and the council meetings and the times with those people that started Whistler. They were very, very special times. At that time, there were two crossroads and one side road coming in. And it used to take so long to drive from Squamish, we played rhyme time word games. And one of our word games was a useful crossing. Um, and that was f a function junction, because we had to turn off there and the name stuck. It was perfect for me. What happened here already? It's perfect for me. Because people say, isn't there too many people in Whistler? No problem. I'm from Europe, so I'm used to people. It's great. You want people, you go to the village, you socialize, socialize you drink a cappuccino, you talk, and then you want quiet? Five, ten minutes away, you drive, to, you drive up the Sioux Valley, or you, you bike up the Sioux Valley. You, I, mean, I, I mean, we have everything. Really, really, I, I totally, I can, th think, I can only think this, this place is really made for me. When I think we used to go drive to Vancouver, to do our grocery shopping and we would shop for two weeks and bring everything up to our house which has a lot of stairs it was a lot of carrying things up the hill um, so what I really like about the changes in Whistler are the grocery stores the doctors the pharmacies things like that there's more traffic there's more people hurrying and pushing you through and trying to make you go faster and that and that kind of annoys you at times, but uh, I try to ignore it, but uh, I guess it's nice, I mean, you can't keep it a small ski village forever. We basically had the best of two worlds, we've had the early days, peaceful and quiet, not much work, uh, and now as we're getting older, we actually have the benefits of uh, services, restaurants, uh, we don't have to go to Squamish anymore to get some dry cleaning done. Uh, or to go to the clinic in Squamish or things like that. So as far as the overall town is concerned, uh, I wonder whether we're stretching the limits a little bit in the sense that uh, everything in nature starts small, starts growing to a certain point, reaches a zenith and then goes over the top and, and starts to deteriorate. And results do the same thing. So the, the question is, should we allow more development uh, or should we just simply lock the door and throw the key away and just polish the product that we have? Well, I think it's, it's uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, but we had no, no thought that it might be uh, as large as it is or so wonderful. 
I mean, all these hotels just, every time we come up, there's a new hotel, it seems. But we had no idea it would grow the way it has. And we liked it the way it was in those days. But you can't, you can't go back. You have to progress, I guess. Well, Myrtle was certainly a, a very progressively minded person. She welcomed it. And uh, having come here by foot from Squamish in 1911 to see what was coming on in the 80s uh, was phenomenal in her lifetime. She thought it was just marvelous. I'm from the state of Maine, and Myrtle is also from about 45 minutes away from our family homestead. So I had the good fortune of being invited to her birthday parties that were conducted by Diane Velo. This time it was in Pemberton at her home. And I saw Myrtle didn't have a drink, and I said, Myrtle, could I get you a glass of wine? And she promptly replied, and very sternly, Jim, there's only two things that are good for a woman, and one of them is scotch. Yes, ma'am, I said, promptly went off and got her a nice single malt scotch. Enjoyed that very much. <laughs> when I walked through the village today, I thought how really lovely it is. And I do have to say, when I see the, the transit buses going by in the middle of the woods, you know, it startles me still to think, my goodness, we've come a long way. <laughs> <laughs>